All right. Well, it's a good evening here in Eastern North America and wherever you may happen to be in the world. I hope you're having a good day or a good night. Um, I am here in Eastern North America. Oh, I'm getting a lot of echo here. No, that was me. Was it? Okay. All right. Live on my other window. So, hey, folks, uh, I am here with uh, my good friends, uh, Chris Kilo to Charlie Julia Bravo out of Connecticut and Tim November 9, Sierra Alpha Bravo out of Illinois. And tonight we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about field day, uh, mm -hmm. field days that we've experienced in the past and maybe some lessons from those. And in addition, to that maybe sharing some uh, some experience, some interesting experiences we've had, and then we'll move into preparations for, for this year's field day. If you have questions or comments, you want to share an experience of uh, your own, then please put it into the comments section and uh, we'll try to get to those as we go along. So first, uh, what I'd like to do is let, let's just start with a quick uh, go around of the three of us here and to say what we've been up to lately. So I am back a couple of weekends ago. I was out on my first camping trip of the year went to a place called Pinery Provincial Park on the shore of Lake Huron. Uh, did a little bit of testing around with some of Tim's uh, antennas and uh, will be posting a video on my channel in the near future with respect to that. Um, Tim, what have you been up to? You know, there's just been, um, the weather has finally turned here. Mm -hmm. So we've got uh, spring days. So I try to go outside and rearrange and clean everything up. And in between that, we're just making antennas. A lot. Of antenna. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Chris. What about yourself? Well, let's see. Uh, the weather has finally broken here in uh, in Connecticut. We had a, a weekend last last weekend was like in the nineties, and I've been waiting for that for the whole winter <laughs> and the spring. <laughs> so it was uh, it was good. I did not get out to operate though. I um, what I did do is I, I got out to a ham fest here in Connecticut. It was the same weekend as um, as Dayton. And um, I pull up to this ham. It was kind of a small ham fest. It had like one row of, of, of tailgaters and like 10 tables inside. And um, so what I did was I, I pull in. I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be a bust, right? Here's the thing. I scored a, a handheld scanner. I got a, um, a, a, a shortwave, little tabletop shortwave uh, radio, which actually I had to open up and fix. The little ferrite uh, antenna, the, the, the little AM long wave antenna antenna uh, ferrite bar broke i had to glue it back together and some wires broke off but i fixed it a 20 dollars radio order and i gotta fix it um picked up a um a wire mold 10 foot long power strip uh for 10 bucks i think the guy charged a dollar a foot and um i picked up a couple of little odds like project boxes stuff like that so actually it turned out to be a relatively successful outing at a ham fest i was uh, on the same weekend as dayton how about that <laughs> nicely done nicely done yeah uh good stuff Okay, let's uh, let's let's get into uh, a little bit of field day talk here. Then uh, I wanted to just uh, get started a little bit. I wanted to tell you about my very first field day, and uh, this would have been back in uh, 1991. I just got my license. Yeah, I was uh, I was a little bit older by that point, but uh, first field day, and uh, the local club was hosting a field day, and. Uh, we got uh, invited to operate the 10 meter station. And uh, at the last minute, we were informed that we needed to bring our own shelter uh, mm -hmm. and our own gear um, and that we would be given a space to set up. Now, a friend of mine who, uh, who was, uh, had some uh, role in the club at the time, he had a 10 meter coaxial dipole. So we figured we're gonna put that up. Uh, we're gonna find something, to, to a tree or something to throw it up into. Uh, we didn't have any shelters. I, I, I was not in outdoors mode. I was in full on family mode in those days. Um, and so I brought along a shelter. It's like, well, I guess I'm going to have to sleep there overnight. I could bring a pup tent. So I brought along a pup tent. I had an HTX 100, one of the realistic 10 uh, meter rigs, the, the mobile rigs. The Ambergo Shack was blowing them out for something like $200 Canadian at the time. And I had picked one up and that was my first HF transceiver. So we had that, we had a, a big battery. We went up to the site and we found out we were in the middle of a field, literally in the middle of a field. There were no trees and it was baking hot. Um, 
we set up the pup tent just out of desperation. And the two of us huddled inside this pup tent, literally, I mean, it, nowadays when I look back at it, I think it looked more like a, a Native American sweat lodge than, than an actual field day station. Uh, and, and, and could, we called and we called and we called, we could only get the antenna up 10 or 12 feet and the band was flat and we had no luck at all. So that was my first field day experience. But I, there's one little asterisk to that that I'd like to tack on. And that would be that, you know, the, a couple of years before, my friend who was involved with the local club, he had been the one responsible for arranging field day. And what he had to do was uh, he had to make sure that food was there for people for dinner in the evening. Now, you Americans, you do field day right. I get the feeling a lot of clubs here in Canada, they just don't do this. They don't do it the same way at all. So what he had arranged to do was uh, he had counted the number of people that were supposed to be there. And then he, uh, he he went out at about 5.30 in the afternoon to a local Kentucky Fried Chicken and bought some, some of the, the buckets of chicken and French fries and whatnot. Just before he was calling, ready to call the people in, to uh, to you know come over and they they believe me there were guys in big trailers in the air conditioned trailers we were you know just an amazing uh, setup but but for the just a very you know a bunch of picnic tables barbecue chicken sitting there a station wagon pulls up some guy piles out of the station wagon with four kids and his wife he walks up to my buddy and he peels off $15, which is the membership fee at that time for the club, and said, here's my membership fee. Where's dinner? <laughs> and they all see, and, and my buddy didn't know what to do. And and, and he, he kind of took the money, and the, the, these this family heads over to the tables where the chicken, and they proceed to demolish the chicken. And then he left. He took his family with him, and there they had their food, and it's <laughs> sweet. <laughs> There's a field day memory for you. Um, I'm gonna eat. But the club got another member. That's all that mattered, right? <laughs> I don't think they ever saw him again. I think yeah, that's the not. truth. Of it. Uh, okay, Tim, do you have a field day story for us? Nothing, nothing like that. I mean, there's just been times. You, you know, I like to run well, contesting contesting days like this, where the bands are very heavy and they're you know people are doing all that stuff. I, I tend to just you know. I'll whip out the laptop and just go digital at that point, you know? So, I mean, I've got tons of stories, you know, the old JT 65 trying to figure out how to put your uh, designation in there and stuff like that. And I'm trying to do this on the fly. Can't be hard, right? We'll just do it. Yeah. We're you know? gonna <laughs> yeah so I'm, you know, so, you know, I'm in the backyard and I got my, my setup and I'm a, you know, uh, telling people I'm a, like a two C or something like that. I mean, it just, it's just a, a, I'd much rather have chicken. <laughs> <laughs> was it extra crispy or was it the the they didn't know. Back, then, back then they didn't have uh, extra crispy and, and i don't think any of the regular club members ever found out <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. but uh you know it's all the usual stuff in terms of field day when you're operating outside i mean you've got it you know sunshine i can't see the computer you know and, and you know my wife's friends decide to show up and they come, well, what are you doing? You know, and I'm trying to, you know, it's, uh, I, I, yeah, I should just, you know, go find a cave or something and just you know, do it in there. There you go. <laughs> it's, it, it's fine. It's fine. Hopefully. And, and this year I, I, you know, I don't, I don't really have the luxury of getting out, out into the field. I've got a park across the street that I go to sometimes and um, I've got a good sized backyard. So that's kind of, you know, that's the restriction on, on my field day activities. I like it. How about it, Chris? What you got for us? Well, the uh, I got the, this. My field of experiences are there's only two. Um, I never really, you know, I was in a couple of clubs through the years, and I never got into the the, the club side of of doing field day, which I know is really the way to. If you really want to have a, a good time with it, that's the way to do it. Um, but uh, my very first field day experience was in um, June of 1976, and I know that date well because that was the day my my novice license came in the mail. And um, so I, uh, my license came to me. I ran upstairs and, and I, I had my, I already I had an HW 16 that I had built and I had this little HG. It wasn't the, it wasn't a matching VFO. It was like an older Heathkit VFO that some guy lent to me. Um, and I had like the little 
Heath kit a uh, little watt meter, which actually I still still have. It's right over next to my my Tempo one, <laughs> and nice. um and a couple of dipoles up, and that was it. So I get on the air. It's it's June of 1976. I, I'm a novice. I know nothing about field day contest. Nothing. I get on the air and I'm calling CQ and and I'm getting people to answer me, but but they're just like. Quick and done. I, mean, I want to have a cue. So it's on. Hey, this, I'm on the air now. This is great. Nobody would would get into a cue. I said, "What's going on?" And then so I called up a friend of my, my a friend of mine who actually got me into the hobby. And I asked him. I said, well, "He says he says, oh, it's field day weekend. He says nobody wants to talk to you. They just want to make contacts." I said, "Oh man, so all right." So, so but here, I mean, talk about like baptism by fire. I mean, I was thrown in. <laughs> there I am. The bands were packed, and I was like, they're trying to make contacts. So so years go by, and there's something I always wanted to do was to um, set up you know, in the backyard, put up a tent, and do the whole field day experience you know, in my yard. I, said, I, I knew I, I, that's something we could do. And I said, so, so two years ago, when, when the whole COVID thing you know, set in, the pandemic, and everybody got locked down, and you really couldn't go out anywhere, um, I said, you know what? I'm going to do it. So I, I got myself a, a little tent, and I got you know extra batteries for my portable gear, my 817, and I got I had I had Tim's link dipole up. I had the the vert, the, the, the silver bullet you know 1000 vertical up. I had a, um, a slim jim antenna hanging off of the same mass, like right at the center of, of Tim's dipole. I had a slim jim hanging from that for two meters and 440. I had every band covered. I I did an experiment with a, with a hunk of long wire i just ran through some trees with this this cheap little tuner that i had the sst tuner and i said i've got antennas i've got everything i had, had my laptop with ft8 got in the tent wouldn't you know it? i get myself set up i'm in the tent not a half hour and this thunder cell came over right <laughs> and it poured so i went outside brought all the antennas down and it poured but here i, I said i'm sticking it out man i'm doing field day so i Stayed in the tent. My wife's in the house laughing the whole time. <laughs> yeah. This dopey tent. But I, I fed. My, I had food out there. I did not go in the house. For, I, I went in the house to use the bathroom. That was it. Everything else was in the tent. Did field day. So I had a blast. That, but that was the year that the league um, started to allow like like home base stations to contact other home base stations, and they counted. And, and so so like if here I am operating QRP. And, it, and I'm, I'm trying to go up against some big guns. I was like, I'm not. I mean, I, out of the whole exercise of you know 20 something hours, I made like 30 contacts, and that was it. So it, it, it was tough, but I did it, <laughs> and I survived. <laughs> Good job. Well done. The perseverance, especially that you know that that first real effort to try to get out there and and do something. Uh, hey, uh, I got a, I got a, I have a question for Tim. Uh, yeah. One of my uh, on my 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 chat line here. Um, uh, Ronnie Julian is asking um, Tim if you sell dipoles and do you have a link? Yes, yes. Um, is there a way to is there a way to uh, let me in the chat? Uh, this was on my channel. Actually, if you jump on my channel, you should you you'll see that answer there. You'll see that comment. Oh, okay. All right. Well, maybe maybe Tracy could give me a wrench or something too. Um, <laughs> You know what? I'll, I'll go at the end of the video. I'll go and take a look and, and make okay. sure all those questions okay. are answered. Um, usually, Tracy will put my email uh, in, in the description, too, and people can just contact me directly. I think we had someone yeah. last time who came through and, and was trying to, to get a hold of me. I just throw the email in there. You can throw my email in the chat, too. Yeah, I'm, I'm letting them know also that um, your, your eBay store is your call sign, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I'm just going to put that in there. I'd, I'd throw your email in there. Sure. Now, Tim. Need some product placement here, real quick. <laughs> How many do we have tonight? I see one, two, three. 24 currently. Nice. Okay. You know, and, and Chris, I'm, I'm really glad you brought up that story uh, with respect to the rain. <laughs> because that is something about field day that you know you have to pay attention to if you're going to be operating in the field uh and i imagine most folks who are watching this are interested in doing so you got to have shelter i mean you've got yes. to be prepared for what comes along uh and and this is something i you know i i did uh, one of my early videos was my first field day in the field where it literally poured rain the entire weekend 
Yes. And if I didn't, and, and I, I had a rough tent. When I say a rough tent, I mean a cheap tent. You know, I we have a we have a, a chain store up here called Canadian Tire, which is the rough equivalent of something uh, I don't know Target or Walmart. Maybe not quite. It's more sporting goods and automotive supplies oriented, but it's that sort of deal. And they sell Coleman tents now. Coleman tents are what they are. They, you know, I know that brand is sold in the U.S. too. Yeah, that's what I actually wound up getting when I did it. it. It's an entry level tent, and and it's it's okay for you know I would say fair weather and a little bit of of of, uh, of of rough weather, but it's not really designed to stand up to some serious elements. But I started off with one of those, and uh, and it served me well. And in that particular weekend. I, what I did is I put up a tarp over top of the tent, which sounds over counterintuitive. Sorry, counterintuitive, because the tent the, the tent itself has a fly on it. But when you start to realize that the water uh, repellency on that scale of tent on that on that level of tent really isn't all it's cracked up to be, um, right. that tarp provides a significant barrier to. The, to the rain that's coming down and it will channel the, the the water away from the tent itself meaning that the fly is not going to get saturated that water isn't going to come inside the tent which you know with, with those types of tents if you get enough rain it will certainly do that mm -hmm. so if you if you're going out there with um uh with a with a let's say an entry level tent uh, then by all means, consider putting a tarp up over top if rain is in the forecast. You know, the other issue is, of course, that rain is not in the forecast. And I've dealt with this situation, too. And I'm a Canadian boy. I can't handle the heat. Uh, Chris, you mentioned something earlier about, uh, you know, looking for the cold. <laughs> no, getting up to those 90 degree temperatures. This yeah. guy starts to melt. <laughs> so so I, need, uh, I need a tarp or something over top of me to, to take that heat away. And uh, you know, my uh, my no bug zone shelter with the, the screened in walls. I yeah. just pull them open if there's no bugs, get a bit of a breeze through, but at least I'm covered. And if not, I've, I've got a, a big orange 13 by nine uh, camping grade tarp, which is a good one uh, that, that provides tremendous shelter and will cover a picnic table uh, mm -hmm. very well, even in a pretty good downpour. So these are, it's, it's, and that's on the rain side, but if, as far as uh, the sun and, and the baking, if you can't set up in a place which, where you get shade, and that's that's my other um, suggestion, is to find a site that gives you some afternoon shade. Not so important in the morning. The morning you can handle it for a few hours, but in the afternoon, if you've got some shade there, uh, you know, set up there. Also, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk. You, you hear a lot of guys talking about, um, well, don't put your antenna too close to trees because they're going to affect the signal. Well, it's it's been my experience that um, with HF antennas, this is not an right. issue. It's not. Uh, an you issue. know, so you don't have to worry about putting your antenna up close next to a tree. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Now it's funny, like you talk about the, the Coleman. Now, now again, I was, I knew I was. This, for me, this the, that field day experience a couple of years ago was. I'd never gone camping since I was in sixth grade when I went with some friends of mine and his parents. You know, it was like it was, it was. Uh, this was, and I was like, I don't know if I'm going to get into camping or not. So was, I'm not going to invest a whole lot of money. So I got the, the Coleman, and um, I was I was waiting. I when that when that thunderstorm came over, I said, I'm going to get soaked. Right. I'll tell you what, the tent was dry. Now nice. again. It was brand new. <laughs> it's the yeah. first time out, right? That's so, important. so it's it stayed dry. I never sprayed it with any of the, the water repellent. I just took it out of the box and set it up. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if I would. To your point, I don't know if I would make that a regular thing to, to dragging that little tent out all the time because it's not it's not a great time. I knew that going in. So, um, but I've seen you that that big that big screen thing you talk about. It, I've seen that in your videos. The big white thing you put up, and it, it's uh, yeah, that that that's the way to do it. Definitely keep it. Um, well, it yeah. seems like a lot of work. It's not. You know what? It's far less effort to put that up than a tarp. Uh, <laughs> strangely enough, all it requires is two eight-foot supports. Um, I can have one of those up by myself in fifteen minutes. Uh, a tarp would take me half an hour. It, it, it just just due to the nature of it, it, the tarp's got a lot more tie-off points. This thing's got uh, you know the the two poles and then you pull off the corners which are low to the ground on either side you're done now what's nice about using that thing that you have is you can put a regular table in inside that 
No, if, if you watch yeah. the, the, the videos of me doing my YouTube, I mean, my, my, my field day thing in the backyard in that little tent, I had a, one of those little camping folding tables. I had two of those <laughs> and the rig was on one and the, and the laptop and the other stuff was on. Yeah. It was really, really tight and, un, and, and uncomfortable in there. It was not, not, a, it was, it was, it was just nuts. <laughs> Chris, that, that's an excellent point. You know, it's, 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 you want to be comfortable. Like like myself talking earlier about being in a pup tent. Well, that's that's the antithesis of of comfortable. Um, I use a uh, when I'm in when I'm using the no bug zone or even in colder weather when I'm in my big five man tent. I went to Walmart and I bought one of their folding pop up uh, uh, white uh, yeah. plastic tables with the fold down legs. Uh, that's tremendous. It, it's I think it's six five and a half or six feet long yeah. and uh, plenty of room and i've even found that uh when i use with my five-man tent it lets me it still leaves room for a sleeping pad and a sleeping bag okay not everybody's hardcore as me it's going to do that but uh that's but i've been really well that night I did it right in. sorry that's what i did that night i had a, a an inflatable an air mattress and a sleeping bag behind me yeah so yeah no, yeah. absolutely. The other thing is now with the no bug zone, which has the uh, the two sloping tarp walls, and it's not a, it's not a thick tarp by this is not a canvas tarp by any stretch. It's a poly tarp, um, right. and then the um, the screened walls. What happens is if it's raining, you're going to find that inside that shelter, about seventy five percent of the square footage inside there, which I think is a a ten by ten space is going to be dry there will be spots inside the rain's just going to get through the yeah. mesh um and, and that's okay because it gives me more than enough room to work with uh when i'm doing my uh, my stuff with that walmart table didn't you do something like that in your backyard i remember seeing you had like a that big thing set up in your backyard you were you were doing some um i thought it was a field day or so there was something you were out there you had a friend of yours with you yep. and you had you, had, you wound up changing radios. I remember that. Yeah, that, that was the COVID, uh, the first year of COVID. Uh, yeah. Then I did that in my backyard and had a terrible time with uh, antenna placement and uh, performance. And, and, of course, that was the year of the big guns, right, where the air all just said, okay, it's a free-for-all now. Everybody can, uh, everybody with all your big home stations can, uh, can have at it. Um, which, by the way, just as an aside, this is an editorial comment. Uh, I'm not at all in favor of that. I, I see it's been made permanent now, and I think yeah, that really, I don't like it either. I, really yeah. hurts low power stations that are trying to get out there and, and really enjoy field day and embrace the whole portable thing. A lot of us, you know, either don't have the wherewithal to set up a proper high power station uh, or, or even the inclination. Uh, you know, you, you don't want to go to all the trouble to do something like that. Right. So uh, I, I think it kind of hinders us, but uh, but yes, that was in my backyard and uh, and it it worked fine uh, for what it was. Those conditions were it was it was that was a tough go. Hey, you know I'm, I'm watching my my comments. Uh, hey Tim, you, you, we were talking about this a, a couple of weeks ago. Um, one of the guys uh, there was a little chat going on in my my feed here, and they were talking about um, there was a guy named Tony in Florida that used to had a YouTube channel. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, yeah, we all know him, K9 ARV. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yeah, Ronnie. We uh, Ronnie Julian was asking about him, uh, and uh, yeah, Tony. Uh, Tony was uh, K9 ARV. Was he had a great channel, and, and I'll tell you what, it was his channel and and um, and Tracy's channel that got me into doing QRP field radio and all that, just from watching both of those guys. But but you did some work uh, with with Tony on antennas, right? Oh yeah, sure did. Uh, yeah, in fact, I, you know his channel was well. I mean, I, I was doing that before, but Tony's channel kind of made it cool, you know. Yeah. So it was uh, it was fun to see him, and his he had some real decent production values out there. We did um, one of the things I did with him specifically was that no feed line dipole, where you would just take the uh, the front connector on the eight seventeen, the little uh, BNC female coming right at the top, and actually, if you take, you have to excuse me for a second, if you take one of these. Yes. And just pop that right in the front with, you know, whatever frequency length dipole you want to work with and go like that. No feed line, nothing. Um, and that we were pretty successful doing that, at least on like uh, well, it, it's it's it, it has to be managed. Right. So 40 meters is a little um, a little long. Uh, 20 and 17 are just about right. 
yeah. but then you got to be careful because your antenna is actually hooked up to the radio so i think he had some wind issues once where uh where it kind of moved the radio on him so um yeah that was a lot of wow that would have been what 2016 2017 yes. yeah, yeah, something like, that. like yep. that yeah yeah i'd love to do that again yeah if well, he's the, out there he should you know yeah i know on. but he, his his channel it, it, it's gone right i mean he, he had a channel which was great and then it then it disappeared then he came back with a different channel and but he didn't put a lot of content and even that disappeared so it's he a shame was, he was doing some stuff the last time i talked to him was about uh, uh, i don't know a couple of years ago right. um and he was on instagram hmm. and he was doing a couple of things on instagram I, I i saw them but i, I haven't heard from him since yeah now, my dipole, yeah. The, the, the link dipole i have from you actually was the the k9 arv right. link yeah. dipole <laughs> Yeah. Hey, guys. Oh, sorry. Go, go ahead, Tracy. I was just going to say, so Tim, M0MML, thank you for staying up late and joining us, Tim. Um, mm -hmm. Would love to know what antennas and other portable gear you guys use. Uh, Tim, you want to give us uh, the way in on that one for us? Well, as far as portable goes, uh, again, I'm a... Uh, um... I just I woke up one day and just looked around and everything I had was Yesu, right? So I didn't try. It was just kind of the way that happened. So I, I have the H seventeen N D. And with that I use any number. I have it set up in a little um on my QRZ page, you'll see a little toolbox looking thing. And I had set that up uh so that I could run SSB, of course, if I wanted to. I've got the, again, I got the, the Yesu version of the SignalLink uh, USB, which lets me run digital to my trusty laptop over here. Um, I had a couple of sealed lead acid batteries in the bottom and a regulator and a bunch of different power pole connections all over the place with which to uh, charge it, power it. It's got a, a solar panel on the back that I can use. I mean, um, and it's all on this little kit thing that, you know, it's like a rolling toolbox kind of thing. So when I swap the, the lead acids out for the uh, LiPo batteries, it's much, much lighter and much, much smaller, too. So and as far as antennas, uh, again, um, I, I just like a, a regular old dipole. I think the OCF, the 436 OCF is probably my favorite just because it's I, I don't need to pack any other antenna as long as I have that. Trouble with that is. You have to have, you use a tuner with it, right? So I've got my little um, MFJ tuner, manual tuner that works with it. And that makes things real easy. But aside from that, just a dipole, a regular 20, 40 meter dipole. The link dipole is an extension of that. Mm -hmm. I got a little bag where I've got, you know, pretty much every frequency uh, cut already. Um, the link dipole makes that a little nicer. But if I'm just out there, the OCF works perfectly fine. And of course, there's the variation of the OCF, which is the micro windom that uh, that Tracy's fond of too. That's another good one. Yeah, hmm. that's what oh, I. Lord. Sorry, sorry, Tim. Go ahead. No, no, I, 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 that's that's the short of it, really. Chris, what are your go-to's? Uh, my my, uh, my pack has been uh, an FT eight seventeen ND from from day one, um, and again, that was from from. Uh, you know, Tracy had a, a great video on it years ago, and 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 also and Tony and and her others, of course. I mean, everyone loved the 817. So you can imagine how upset I was when 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 Tracy said, "I'm selling my 817 and I'm buying an Icon." I was like, "What a minute! I bought this radio because of you." <laughs> but I um so so for antennas, um, I I actually I have there's two that I use. I have your your the the link dipole for 20 and 40, um, with the um, I use a, a Shakespeare fiberglass extension, you know fishing rod which goes up about 20 feet i think in the middle um and i just put it up as a v i use these orange tent peg plastic tent pegs at each end with little short bungee cords to keep it tight and um luckily i'm tall enough if i want to change bands i can reach up and, and <laughs> put in the link i can reach it <laughs> um it's either that or i'll use the uh, the silver bullet uh, 1000 the wolf river coil with um um, I have that MFJ 1979, the, the, the long 17 foot whip, right? Um, and I'll put that on. Now, what I learned with the Wolf River tripods, they have two length, uh, two leg sets you can get. They have a short leg set, which I had in the beginning. And that antenna, if it was a slightly breezy day, I was always going out, picking it back up. I was throwing weights on the bottom of it so it wouldn't fall over. 
the longer legs work a lot better. So, so that's if anyone has that antenna and you don't have the long legs, get them. But those are the two antennas. I use that radio. Battery wise, I had the SLAs, and it, you're right, they weigh a ton. Yep. Um, when I did field day, I had two of them fully charged, which the funny thing was, I had that 8C, 817 going 20 something hours, and I didn't run out of one battery. So it was great. Yeah. But then I went, I got, I got the BioNO, the four and a half amp hour BioNO. Huge difference. It's great. I, I I did I did tell a lie though. I also have um, the Super Antenna MP1 with the coil on it that I use, mm. and the whip is the whip is the the MFJ whip that you get for yeah. twenty bucks or something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yep. That's kind of a pain though because then you've got to tune radials and lay things out and stuff like that. And that yes. requires some forethought, and I'm you know that sometimes well, yeah, it's funny with, with the with the Wolf River coil. I find I use their their radio. I got their radials. Man, I used, had made my own in the beginning of the nest. Eh, I'll just get theirs. So I got they're 33 feet long. I just throw them out on you know on the ground it's equally spaced as best I can. And I you connect them to the base and the tripod and put the vertical up and it works. I've I've used it on you know 20 and 40 uh with some success. So we all know what Tracy uses. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, I've still got it. my, and I did get my 817 back, Chris, so. I know you did. <laughs> all was well with the world again. Um, my uh, my 897, uh, you know, that's another one of my favorites. Uh, the 891 that I'm using now, uh, I you know, and I, I got to tell you, I still haven't warmed up to the 891. I, I used it a couple of weeks ago, and... Um, there's something about the audio coming out of it. Now, I'm the first guy who's going to admit there's a lot going on under the hood of that rig. Uh, you know, I've got an, a 991 here as well. And these are not you know, appliance operator type rigs. These are rigs where you really got to go into the menus and you got to do some customization mm -hmm. to get them working just the way you want to. And, and I mean, there's a lot going on and you can really make some, some great adjustments to it. But I haven't. Uh, had the opportunity yet to really dive into that. So we'll see. But um, as far as antennas go, uh, Tim, you nailed it. Uh, that, that 40 through 10 meter mini Wyndham is one of my favorites for sure. Uh, also, I do like the off-center feds, uh, whether it's the 80 through 10, if I have enough room, or the um, the 40 through 10. And, and let's not forget that uh, I, I also use the high-end fed antennas out of Holland. And those have been tremendous performers for me as well. Uh, very nice in situations where you only need one end up high and then the other end comes down to the rig and uh, a very straightforward setup. Now, Tracy, what, what um, you, you have, like, your, your extending poles are much taller. I mean, I'm using the, the, the little fishing pole thing, but you've got like, you have the soda beams, is that what you're using? No, no, no. So I have, um, I've got a couple that I use. I have a spider beam. Uh, it's the 40 foot, the 12 meter mast. Uh, and then I've got a DX wire, 15 meter mast. DX wire is a company out of Germany and uh, they, they sell this. Now uh, I was able to, to buy one when Ron and Holland at a uh, high end company was selling them. Uh, otherwise you have to order them direct from Germany and the shipping is a nightmare uh, cost, but that's a wonderful pull. That, that is right now. That is my favorite pull to work with because these poles um, get thinner near the top and they will bend if you put any kind of pressure on them from a wire. Um, you know, I can put up uh, the, 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 the feed point of one of Tim's die poles up at 40 feet. I, I wouldn't put it up any higher because the pole is just going to go like this and I'm going to lose all that height, but I can put the feed point up at about 40 feet and uh, there, that's a really good height. That's for, a great for height. Off center foot. That, that, that's a great height to get to. 40 feet is great. It's better than I did with the bag, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I, I remember watching one of, one of Tracy's videos, and you had, like, all those poles out, and I was like, man, oh, man, he is hardcore, man. <laughs> <laughs> I have this dream, okay, where I just have a backpack and the 891 and a couple of batteries and a dipole and a throw bag. Right. And and you just walk out into the wherever the hell you're going to go and, you know, throw it up and then just start operating. And then reality kind of, you know, conflicts with that after a while. One day I'll get there, I'm sure. But, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Polls, polls. I, I, I just I hate carrying things. And I have to buy them and I don't like buying things. So 
<laughs> what am I gonna do with a 40 foot pole? I, I do uh I do um want to get the tent that attaches to the back of the Jeep though. Mm. Right? By mm. the tent that hooks onto the thing and the comes up and you just you're in the car because I've got like power outlets in the back and stuff like that. And uh, that that's gonna be fun. I'm I'm gonna do that if I can, you know, ever get out of the basement. But uh, I wanted to do that this field day. But I don't know if that's going to be possible. So uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. I will be a 1B, though, whether it's in the backyard or, or you know, down the road at the at the K-1000 park or something. There you go. Uh, either one. Something. Hey, uh, Tracy, I just got a, a question. And actually, um, uh, this is from uh, uh, John asked, is, is anyone using an NFED? Tracy, are you using an NFED in your mix? Oh, yeah. So the high-end Fed antennas are all NFEDs. Okay. So yeah, they're the they're ones out of Holland that, uh, and uh, they've been tra now they're resonant. They're not random wire, uh, and uh, they they're top top drawer. They're they're just extremely well made and uh, perform very well. Never had an issue making contacts with one of their antennas. My plan is to in fact uh, right here still in the box. <laughs> um, Tim had uh, I, I got one of Tim's uh, N feds to put up, and um, that's going to be my my next. Uh, my next oh, experiment. I'm thinking I'm going to try it at home first because I've got crack it open. Yeah, you know, you're right. I'm crack it. Um, <laughs> why show you the box? experience? That box is empty. Don't let him lie. Yeah, it feels like sand. <laughs> <laughs> um, the um, the, the uh, what I was going to do at first was uh, on the back of the house. I have a nice screened-in porch, and I've got trees off to the side of the house. So my plan was to just kind of throw it up in the tree, feed it into the porch and drag the 817 out there and uh, operate that way. A lot of times that that's what I do. I've got, uh, actually, I have three. Look at the way this is packed. Oh, this is cool. I know, it's gorgeous. <laughs> I, I, that's, I have three antennas. I have three antennas in the you know, set up and I've got the main one, which is the big uh, 80 meter OCF. Tracy and I actually have the same one. I made one, I made his and I made mine at the same time. Um, then I've got an N fed that runs into my neighbor's tree. And then I've got another setup that I use for dipoles and half squares and things like that, which runs the length of the backyard. So, uh, that, uh, yeah. So sitting in the screened in porch or running it down to the basement, I actually took the glass out of my windows in the windows in the window well and replaced mm -hmm. them with plexiglass. And I was able to drill holes in them for barrel connectors so I can, you know, do the coax. Nice. Okay. Right There's the Tim's antenna. So you got the, the box with your, your connection on the bottom. And I had Tim do the uh, PL to the uh, SO239 for me on that. And um, not knowing what radio, because sometimes I operate out of my truck with where the 7100 is, and I'll just probably run a hunk of, you know, RG8X with, with PLs on each end. So here's the, here's the length of wire. Here's a little counterpoise section. And this is what I really can't wait to try. This little stake you put in the ground. And, it get, and that way you can use the ground as your counterpoint. So I'm really isn't looking for it. Yeah. Is, is, isn't I'm, that fun? Yeah. Isn't that fun? I mean, about yeah. options, you, you know, a, a lot of people yeah, don't have options. So right. they, there's people options. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm not out of the box. It'll, it'll, it'll inspire me to go out and set this thing up. <laughs> the thing was I wanted something to give to somebody that they could just take out of the bag and use right away. Yep. That they didn't have to fool around with the counterpoise and, you know, do all of that right. stuff. Right, just throw it up in the tree and stick the yeah. thing in the ground and hook up to your radio. Yep. And, I, and I've got a trellis, actually a garden trellis near where the coax comes into the house. So the, that's where the alligator clip thing came from because I could just clip onto that trellis. And it's steel, you know, and it's, you know, two feet in the ground or three feet in the ground or whatever. So, you know, that works. So it, right. just, it's just to give somebody an option. Tim. Uh, and and Chris, we've got a, a comment in here. This is something Tim you were alluding to earlier. Uh, Mike has uh, got a question. Now I, I'll just answer very briefly uh, Mike's question from my perspective. I've never used that coax. Uh, I, th I think I have a mobile mount, uh, a VHF UHF mobile mount that just used something that thin to get uh, the wire into the car, and then yeah. it came to convert. Uh, it had an SO239 for connecting your coax to. But as far as HF portable goes, I've never used it, so I can't weigh in on this one. Tim, uh, well, you, you were talking about this earlier this evening. What uh, what were your thoughts on it? Is, it? is this the, what are your thoughts on RG316 or RG174 coax? Yeah. Operating portable. Yeah, uh, I think mine was RG58 that I was going to try, though. But uh, that fellow uh, uh, was a G, uh, G0T. 
PIM or something? Uh, Golf 5 Tango Mike. Has an excellent video where he's talking about uh, coax losses on you know portable QRP setups. Mm. He's had some really good experience, I guess, on, on shorter lengths of uh, you know using um, 176, I think it was. And he was comparing losses compared to like uh, RG8X and 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 apparently the conclusion. I watched the video. I mean, it, it's well done. The conclusion at the end was, well, if you're only running 25 feet or 20 feet or something like that, it really doesn't matter. So go with the lighter stuff. The losses aren't that heavy. But if you're going to go further than that or a longer length than that, that's when the losses start piling up. But I think you only lose uh, a, a couple of dB, I think, on the 176. So after seeing that, I'm going to – usually I use RG8X. That's, that's pretty much all I use. And I, I think, you know, it's just – it's just what I use. And I wanted to try some of the uh, slimmer stuff here shortly. Yeah. I, I hope that uh, answers the question. David's got a question. Or he's got a comment here. David, I'm reading this. Uh, consider elevation and local RFI of trying out gear at home before deploying in the field. Performance will vary. And I'm wondering if you're talking about the elevation and local RFI at the, uh, the place you're, you're thinking of operating at. Which would be an excellent uh, thing to do. I'm I'm actually trying to book a campsite for the CQ Worldwide uh, Single Sideband DX contest in October, and uh, I've got a chance at a site. But there's big solar panels there, and there's some big poles with lights. So I don't know if that's going to be an issue or not, and I don't know if I'll be able to get out there and test it in advance. So not sure if that's what you were talking about, David, but. Uh, I think those are great points when considering a site for uh, something like field day or, or even POTA for that matter. Yeah. yeah. See, the way I read this is um, if you're trying it out at home, like, let's say we throw an NFED here and uh, I've got power lines that run just on the other side of my house and, and around the backyard. Right. So sometimes uh, depending on, on what I'm doing, I can hear them, mm -hmm. you know, so that's not something I'm going to run into if I'm theoretically out in, some park somewhere you know so it's going to be a lot quieter so just because you pull it up at home and you get uh, you get some noise and you get some of this you, you may not have that and if you're down in a hole obviously you know performance is going to degrade a little bit as opposed to you know climbing the summit or you know whatever it is that you choose to do hmm. Hmm. so one of us is right <laughs> one of us answered the question i concur <laughs> 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 yes, uh, David Vaughn in the comments says under 50 feet it doesn't really matter. Yeah, that's the question I can't yeah. do. So yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I've seen things out in the field. I mean, guys guys bring their direct berry cable, you know, and they've got this <laughs> stuff, and, and you, you no, because Tim, they think that you know if they're if they're if they go to a smaller a smaller gauge or a lighter coax that there are all these losses, which just isn't necessarily the case. Yeah, in you know, practice, and, on paper, yeah. in practice, you you raise a you raise a good point, Tim. So you and I were talking before we went live here uh, about my experiment. I bought some a uh, couple of years ago. I bought some ABR, some high quality RG8X uh, type. Uh, it's the same size as RG. I figured, you know what? I'm going to give this stuff a try. It's 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 clearly it's more expensive than uh, the the run of the mill. Does it come from Germany too? Uh, sorry? Does it come from Germany too? Like no, I, I, this stuff I think is made in the U.S. actually. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it's more money. It's got to be better, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, the thing with this stuff is, Chris, that it's, um, it's a solid uh, braid. So oh, okay. you know, the loss is very low. Yeah. I'm going to give this stuff a try. Well, is it flexible? Tell you. flexible? Sorry? Is it flexible? Well, there's the there's the nut. Mm. So I got it out to the field, uh, this brand new cable, and started to work with it, and realized this stuff is more difficult and awkward to work with than mm. it is worth. Uh, so I have I, I've got it coiled in a nice coil with my gear here, and I don't take it out to the field anymore. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll stick to the run of the mill stuff. Um, it's just too hard to work with in the field, and and. I don't think you can convince me that the losses 
that it would uh, make up for would make any difference at all in the received signal strength at the far end. Mm. Mm. I had a the reason why I asked that is I had a somebody um, back in my broadcast engineering days, a vendor had had given me a roll of of cable that was RG eight had the exact same specs as RG eight X, but it was it was rigid. I mean, you you could take the wire, do that with it, and it would stay that way. And I was like, uh, okay, but I got it for nothing, so okay. So I used it at home. You know, when I ran the cable through the house, and, and you put a PL two fifty nine on it, it worked. It, it, you could it worked that way. It didn't have the solid braid though. It, it was still braided, but it was just I don't know what it was about that cable. You it was not flexible at all, and you could easily kink it and, and ruin it. So yeah. Uh, yeah, I was not happy with that stuff. So so when I first became a ham, I like everybody else decided that you know. I got to have that. I got to get me one of those, right? So <laughs> here I ran I ran a whole bunch of the direct berry. I don't know. This is so old that that the writing has gone off it. I'm sure it's like a, a, yeah, whatever this is. What's the nice one uh, that everybody buys? The Belden or something like that? It's one of those direct yeah. berry cables. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. You know, and, uh, remember those things we had as a kid? You used to work your uh, triceps or something doing these? That's what this is like. <laughs> yeah. You know? Uh, so, one, yeah. of my, one of the comments I have here was uh, Ronnie says he's had he has 200 feet of RG11. Use what you have. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I think that's the best answer of all. Exactly. All right. <laughs> Guys, uh, you know, so so coax is a fascinating topic, but there's a, a really good topic we haven't even addressed yet, and that's batteries. Um, mm -hmm. I think we gotta we gotta spend a little bit of time talking about batteries. Agreed. Especially for a um, an event like Field Day, you know, it's one thing to go out there for Poda for two or three hours and uh, and run with uh, you know run with a, a ten amp hour battery, and you're going to have plenty there, even if you're running a hundred watts. Yeah. But if you're talking about a weekend long event, now you really got to take a look at you know some of those key factors. How good an antenna system are you running? i.e. how much power do you need to run to be heard if you're running a compromised antenna you'll need to run more power to be more effective and if you're running more power now you're going to need more battery life um this is why you know it, it i i know um th there's some people out there that have uh target boards with my photo on it because i say things like don't use compromised antennas so we're taught whether we're talking about things like um you know the uh, hamstick dipoles or whether we're talking about magnetic resonant loops uh, or, or some of the other uh, name brand kit type antennas with the loading coils and the, the whips. Yeah, those will work. You, you will make some contacts with those, but a lot of the guys who use those successfully are putting out 100 watts. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to do that, you're going to need a big enough battery to run 100 watts. And if you're talking about the an event like field day, which is 24 hours, now you may not, and that's the other thing. How are you going to run? Are you going to run 24 hours? Most of us don't. Uh, like if I'm going out to field day and I'm running the station alone, which is usually what happens, then you know I'm going to get there. I'm going to have all the antennas set up. So by the time the uh, two o'clock Eastern rolls around, I'm on the air. I'm making contacts. I'm probably going to pull the plug sometime around five or five thirty in the afternoon. I'm going to make myself some dinner and then I'm going to get back on maybe around seven ish. And then I'm going to run until 10 or 11 o'clock at night. If I'm staying at a campsite, they're going to want me to shut down at 11 o'clock because they don't like noise after 11. So I've got to be mindful of the people around me, which is another reason I like to choose if I can get them private campsites. So then I wake up Sunday morning have some breakfast. I'm probably on the air by 8.30 or so. And now I'm going to run probably till through till about noon when the heat starts to get to me. If it's a hot weekend, I'm going to start packing stuff up, even though the contest is still going. So therefore, I'm going to need a battery that's probably going to, I'm probably going to need a battery that's going to last me 10 or 12 hours. Mm -hmm. And and now I take a look at, okay, if I'm running uh, a dipole antenna and it's, I've got it at the apex up at 40 feet, I've got a pretty decent antenna system for field day. Uh, and then what bands am I working on? Well, typically 40. You know, 40 is a money band for me. Um, 20, I avoid like the plague because it's jammed 
with stations wall to wall. There's it's a small band. Uh, everybody jumps on 20. So I'll, I'll skip up. I hope that that 15 is open. 80 used to be a money band. I uh, you know I'm thinking back uh, 20 years ago. But for something's happened, at least in my area, within my range, uh, I don't find many field day contacts uh, on, on 80 meters these days. Um, and, and so I tend to stick to either 40 or 15. Uh, so so I've got my antenna up. It's at a decent height. Um, I've got I've, I've to run my station. Now, am I going to, in these days, with all the 100-watt stations with, um, with, with home station antennas, uh, that are you know permanent and you got lots of guys with really good antennas up there uh, they're providing all kinds of competition for us weak guys in the field I've had a tremendous amount of difficulty the past couple of years with a QRP signal uh, on field day and, and I'm going to try it again this year but I'm not going to be stuck to it I'm going to I'm going to be using 20 watts so given that I'm going to be running 20 watts, now it comes down to, okay, what's my rig going to draw? Is my rig going to, am I going, if I'm not going to use the 817, then now I'm looking at my 897 running it at 20 watts. And that'll, that'll draw on receive about 600 milliamps. My 891, I can tweak it so that it'll draw about 900 milliamps. But think about that. That's 50% more than the 897 will require. And what am I getting? Uh, you know, what am I getting? It, it, do I really want to run that 891, which is a nice radio? It's got a lot of great capability, but I'm paying a penalty in battery life to run that radio. So what I've done uh, just recently is I've jettisoned all of my SLA batteries. I was using a combination of, uh, I had three 17 amp hour batteries, uh, SLA batteries. Of course, they're, they're big, they're heavy. Um, and I had uh, 12 amp hour uh, and then for running the QRP rig, I had a three amp hour and a seven amp hour. I've gotten rid of all those now. I've now got in my stable, I've got two 10 amp hour lithium iron phosphate. They're not going to be any good for field day. I, I need more than two 10 amp hour uh, batteries to be able to do that. Um, and, 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 and I'm still playing with them just to see exactly how much life I can get out. Because I may even be wrong about that, but based upon my preliminary work over the past few camping trips that I've done, I, I don't think it's going to carry me through field day. So I've just invested in a in a 30 amp hour uh, lithium iron phosphate, which I believe will take my 897 uh, straight through field day and I won't need to use any of the 10 amp hours as a backup. Mm -hmm. I you know, would look into ahead. a way to recharge as you're using. It's not difficult. You can get a, a cheap regulator. And if you've got like a, a, like I've got a goal zero solar panel, um, 15 watts or something like that, you know, and if you tie that into just a, a small regulator and you're only running the radio and, and that's pretty much it, I, you can, you might be able to get uh, some more juice out of that thing, or at least not have to worry about having to recharge all the time. <laughs> And 15 watts for a solar panel is kind of light. I mean, there are other ones, but, you know. You know, when I, when I did my, my field day thing in the yard, I I, I was I was SLA. The, I had the one 8-amp-hour SLA, right? And I got another one. So I had two of them. And so I did some of the calculations. And, and that, I also said, well, you know, I'm going to get the the, um, the bio-NO, the small one, because I know I'm going to use it for pot activation. So I got I had that, too. But I operated the 817. But, I, I mean, I was... I hit it pretty hard, like, you know, the whole time trying to make contacts. Um, probably the same length of time, Tracy, you were talking about how long you would be on on Saturday and how long you'd be on on Sunday. And here's what I found. I didn't have to change battery at all. I was on the 8-amp hour battery with the 817 the entire time. And what's interesting, and what I think is a, 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 a necessity in your kit is to have one of those little digital meters that goes in line with the battery, so you can kind of, it's its like your fuel gauge, right? So you can see how much battery you've used. Um, with mine, I used maybe half of it. I was really, really surprised. But, but you know, again, like it, it's smart, you know, to, to calculate it all out, make sure you've got enough so you're not out there, oh, man, here it is, it's the middle of the night, and I got nothing. My bat, my batteries are dead. You know, you, you don't want to be in that position either. No, you know, you, you, you make so much of an effort to get out there. The last thing you want is to be out of juice, right? Yeah. But that meter, I, I, Trace, you have one of those too, right? 
I, I've little... got a couple of them actually. Yeah, they're. Uh, but but the thing I like here's you know I use this antiquated technology. The as you know, Chris uh, the 817 right uh, and the 897. They both have that that input voltage meter That's right true. on the display. That's true. And why Yesu ever did away with that is is a mystery to me. And you know, there's there's a menu setting to go and allow you to measure voltage. It's not the same voltage. It's not the input voltage. Um, so you know, it's like uh, that's another reason to hang on to the old stuff. Never mind the fact that it just works well in the field. It, it just right. there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, you know, I've I've had I had a situation um, camping with the 891 last fall where I had some ridiculous QRM. And uh, the 891 couldn't touch it, couldn't touch it. Now, uh, it may be that I, because I was inexperienced with the 891, uh, you know, I, 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 there might have been something I could do. But then we kind of get into the whole business of it's kind of difficult to uh, to navigate all the ins and outs of the 891 until unless you really spend a lot of time getting to know it. And I really don't think it would have done much anywhere uh, anyway, because I, that S, that, uh, I was getting S9 noise uh, up there, so... Good night, Mike. <laughs> Just so Mike put a thing up, he's got to get the kids to bed. <laughs> Take care of the youngins. So look at this, uh, Nathan. A good. There's something I've never done, Nathan, is just try to see how many hours an 897 will run on. And by the way, you can tweak an 897 too to extend that. I don't know if you've already done that, uh, you know, turning off the DSP, for example, turning off the backlight. Um, things like this will will increase the the, uh, the the run time of the 897, even the 817, uh, considerably. So that, that that's that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Well, look yeah, at this. Wow. Have five elements on 15 and 10, and three on 20 to point your way. Hope that will help. Don, <laughs> it should absolutely help. Hope <laughs> for you. That's a, that's a cloud burner. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's funny that like we for field day especially, you really want to think about power. You know, it's, you know, Tim, you were talking about like a solar panel. When I did my my little thing, I thought about getting a little solar panel thing to to top the batteries off if I needed to. I was concerned actually that I might want up something that might create a lot of RF noise because I, that's what I was reading about and it was. I was like, you know what? My head's going to explode. I, I'm just going to go with enough battery power and go with that. So, well, I, I in my case, the Goal Zero stuff. Goal Zero makes makes some nice stuff, um, and I haven't run into that problem. Okay. Myself. Okay. But I'm running it through. I mean, again, it's you've got a, a controller and a regulator, and you know, I've got a bunch of other bells and whistles and stuff on on my on my little setup. So you're not getting any RF noise out of it. Well, I, I, Good. I'm any, but you know, it's not. It's negligible. It's manageable. And Tracy, question, the question for you, Tracy, from uh, Ronnie is um, he's new to the 891 and he wants to know if the backlight can be turned off on it. Yes, it, it well, it can be turned down significantly and that results in a huge gain in current draw. Um, I'm going to be making a video about this shortly, but uh, that is that is uh, that is the single biggest uh, uh, current draw thief. In the 891 is that backlight. Hmm. Hmm. You know, it's funny. I'm not, I, every time I see the 891 out there and, and like the, just with Dayton going on, it was a lot of sales like HRO, they're all running sales on it. And I was like, I don't know. I just can't do it. I'm not, you know, I, I hear, I keep hearing these other stories, but it's menu intensive. It's this, it's that. I was like, okay. Don't feel bad. Uh, you know what? On Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, you know, I'm I'm with my mouse, you know, about ready to buy the damn thing. And <laughs> Thursdays, Saturdays, it's you know, forget it. Yeah. You know, yeah. but <laughs> it's you know, it, I I think it I think it's an interesting thing. Uh, you, you raise a good point, guys. Uh, it's not universally loved, um, and I think there are good reasons for it. And 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 yet and yet there is a very significant. Um, fan base for it. And, and I think those people have, I, I think they're, they're I, I do believe they have, um, they're right about things. It's a good technological radio. You cannot beat the price for what it gives you. It's a solid rig. It's not a Chinese junk. Um, it is, uh, it is a very well-made radio, but 
to me, you know, the usability is just that. It, it, and, and then I, I mentioned that 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 audio issue I was running into while camping a couple of weekends ago. I'm still trying to figure that one out. I, I, I'm not ready to, to condemn the rig because I think it's a good rig. I just wonder if at the end of the day it's going to be the right rig for me, and I'm not sure it is. Now, is there anything else out there to compete with it? I don't think so. I like the mobile form factor. You know, I know people are uh, just just love their their Elecraft products, but I've had so many people tell me that they're kind of afraid to take it out in the field because it it doesn't feel quite as solid. You got a big beautiful display there, which which maybe will scratch easily. I know there are cases and whatnot for them. I don't own one. Uh, I'm told the receiver is excellent. Uh, I have no reason to doubt any of that, but. Uh, there's also something about that form factor. You know, I, I maybe it's just because I'm old school. It probably is. But I like that mobile unit form factor. To me, it feels more solid. When I take a look at something like, you know, the Elecraft uh, KX2, for example, and the ICOM 705, where you've basically got, you know, the radio um, uh, in this, uh, it doesn't have any depth to it. Uh, it's it, it seems a little awkward. I know it's not. I know it's not. But up here, this is this is the way it registers for me. And of course, uh, the Elecraft and the the Icom seven hundred five are very expensive radios. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. I see. Don Don's encouraging me. He says he's telling me that I can get used to the menus. <laughs> You know, and it's probably one of those things where you can set the menus once and never have to worry I about going into them again. Right, right. You know, so I'm, and, and I'm not sure that this is fair. One of my knocks against the 891, and, and the re, one of the reasons I bought the rig was its uh, DNR, the, 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 the noise reduction. It, it, they've got an interesting system there, and it takes, it's, it's counterintuitive. So what happens is you, you you turn the DNR on and it, it's got a scale from one to fifteen. Now when you turn on one, you can hear the DNR kick and it works pretty good. Then you go up to two. What you think you're doing is increasing the DNR. You're not. You're choosing a completely different algorithm that will try to attack the sound. So you're supposed to go between these fifteen different discrete settings to see which one sounds best. And and. 14 is completely different from 8, which is completely different from 5. So I, I've, I have fiddled with it and fiddled with it here in the shack while I've been working during the day. Yes, and I have been getting some work done. Um, and, uh, and and I, I still haven't really been able to see a situation where it's done such a nice job that I sit back and say, oh, that's fantastic. Now, the rig that uh, that I sold a few months ago is an ICOM 7410. Now, that is a base radio. It's not a portable radio, so it's probably not even a fair comparison. But when I turned the digital noise reduction on in this shack with all the RF, the, all, the, all the noise and everything else that I deal with here, it's like it turns single sideband into, into the FM stereo. It's just unbelievable. And, and you don't have these 15 different levels to mess with. You've got a continuous dial, and you just turn it up as far as you need to. And my gosh, it was awesome. So when I compared the 991, that which uses the same system as the 891, and the 891 to that 7410, it's like, I think I've been spoiled by the other rig. Mm -hmm. ICOM's DNR, I mean, their, their noise reduction is outstanding. I have the, the 7100 in my truck, and there's a lot of ignition noise in that thing. And, and I just turn on the, the noise reduction, and, and, and same thing. I'm, I turn around the sideband while I'm mobile, don't hear any noise at all. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, they do, they've, they've got that lick, that's for sure. Lou, I, we're, I'm with you, Lou. Hope all the bands improve by field day. Uh, that would be fantastic, especially the high bands. That makes a huge difference. You know, if 15 is open and if 10 is open, wow, what a what a great field day. Uh, 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 th th those, th 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 there's memories made of stuff like that because because yeah. now you, you're able to work uh, some of the international stations yeah. that are trying to contact you for field day. That, that's a lot of fun. So here's a quick question. The, if the... If you go out to a park, a POTA park on field day, right? Does it count as an activation? Oh, oh yeah. sure, absolutely. Yeah. You know who's got a good string of stuff on that is um, was it KB nine or VBR? Yeah. Uh, I can't remember Michael. his name. Uh, Michael is that yep. his name? Yeah. Yeah. He's got a he's got a string of field day slash soda POTA. Okay. Uh, videos on there. I, I thought it did. I mean, look, you're 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 portable. You're operating. You're in a field. So okay. it's your, 
But but I'm, I th I think anybody who's operating POTA that weekend is probably a glutton for punishment. <laughs> now, if you're operating in 40 meters during field day at POTA, you might yeah. get some contacts, but I think you're going to get a lot of QRM from people calling CQ field day. 17 yeah. meters. Yeah. Uh, we got the usual POTA pilot. True. Good point, Tim. Absolutely. Get on 17 meters. Uh, 30 meters, um, even 12 if it's open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And see, you guys are you guys are all uh, uh, phone operators, right? You, you know, True. I mean, you don't don't have so much trouble with the digital on the digital end of this. So, Great. you know, I, I don't. I saw Joseph's comment earlier about 100 watts on FTA. Yeah, probably expect some of that. <laughs> That's yeah. like 1500 watts on sideband, isn't it? I know. Oh, yeah. But anyway, yeah. what are you gonna do? Well, guys, it's uh, we're, we're we're past the top of the hour now. Um, any uh, any final thoughts on field day? What about you, Tim? Anything we haven't addressed that you'd like to uh, chat about? No, no. I, I just think you know, there's so many topics that you know we could we could cover. You know, portable operation, coax, antennas. I you know we should probably do this more often. What are we going to do for field day, though? I mean, are you going out? Are you going to be at a place right for for field day? Yep. Are you, yeah, so I, I'm actually heading out to the same site I was at last year, which was a really good site at a local provincial park. I lucked into this one. I did, did some pre-scouting and found it last year. And uh, it's private. It gives me some space. Um, and uh, I'll be able to put up my 50-foot pole. And uh, the uh, the the uh, I, I haven't decided yet whether I'm going to use the mini Wyndham, Tim, or the uh, 80 through... 10 uh, off center fed just in the just in the event that there's some activity on 80 i'll be able to pick up some contacts there always have a backup yeah. 80 used to be such a good band well at uh, night you know, at night then there a d layer thing there you know i, I 80 80s 80s great at night mm. digital yeah maybe that's it <laughs> you know, yeah, I, I used to make, I used to make, my, mind you, I'm thinking back to a time when, uh, after that pup tent fiasco, we used to go to a friend of mine's uh, house and he had a, his parents had a home right on Lake Ontario, literally on the shore of Lake Ontario. And it had a huge backyard. We erected a seven, uh, 175 foot random length wire uh, along with a, a ground wire that uh we we threw a we threw a rock into the lake with uh, wire tied around it and that was our ground boys <laughs> <laughs> did it work oh yeah no problems on 80 meters boy oh my gosh we were a uh, rocking and rolling there yeah 80 meters says it's uh you know that's where i go 40 is not a lot of fun for me in the city i, I mean i get what you say about 40 um you know 20 and 17 have always been my go-to bands stuff um <clears throat> yeah late at night you, you know I'll, I'll turn i'll turn on 80. um it's 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 noisy but you know you get a lot of nets and things like that on there you know i'd be uh, mm. i have i have never tried it on field day maybe i should maybe i will this time i don't know so you know 80 has a bad reputation at least within the receiving uh around my area here you know so southwestern uh, southern ontario you know i i get uh, i i sometimes i can't sleep in the middle of the night and I'll come down here for an hour and rather than turn on television, I'll come down here and turn on. The only activity I can pick up is 80. And uh, there's usually some good old boys talking down there. They're carrying on interesting radio related conversations. Sure. I don't hear a lot of junk on 80. So I guess is what I'm trying to say. I Maybe. haven't, I haven't been on the, each yeah. other. Yeah. I haven't been on the phone portion of 80 for a while. So I have to take your word for it. And I think it's, I think it's probably better than it was. Okay, um, I've just got a couple things. Oh, so here we go. Uh, Don's asking the grid square for the park. Don, if you uh, Google um, Bronte Creek Provincial Park, then uh, you might be able to, to look that up. I, I don't have that on the top of my head. He's going to point those beams at you and flip you out of your chair. <laughs> yeah. He's going to fry the front end of my rig. <laughs> Chris, do you have any uh, any parting shots with regard to field day? Any, any topics that maybe we haven't addressed that you'd like to uh, mention something about? No, I, I think we got it all. We talked antennas, radios, batteries, and um, at, yeah. Yeah. I thought Joseph, I Joseph Joseph came up with the grid square off the top of his head. <laughs> of course he did. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> yeah, that's, that is pretty funny. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm, I'm kicking around the idea of, of like this this year. I really haven't made a plan for field day, so. Um, but I, you know, I might, I'm, I'll probably do something here from, from home again, just like battery operated and throw Tim's, you know, end fed up in the tree and have at it. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. Gentlemen, uh, I thank you very much for, uh, for joining me tonight. This has been a lot of fun as usual. And for everybody who's, uh, who's watching and, uh, uh, who's, who's joined us. Thank you very much. We really appreciate having you along for the ride and your, your questions and comments make it so much more fun for us. Um, we are planning on doing at least one of these every month, henceforth. Uh, we're also looking at, um, at bringing in some guests uh, to join us uh, over the next few months, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to arrange for some of those. But uh, thanks for thanks for joining us. Uh, it's It's been great, and uh, look forward to doing the next one. And happy field day. Good field day to everybody who's going to be participating. Yes. <laughs> happy field day. All right. Good night, guys. Good night.